Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be the first lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. Now, me and you have a very exciting journey ahead of us. And for this journey, we need to be well equipped. What that means is that we need to know which tools to take with us. As an excited apprentice, I can imagine that all the tools that are available to you on the market are tools that you would like to have. But it's not necessarily the tools that make you a great artisan. It's you knowing how to make the best use of the simplest tools because you have mastered the techniques. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at all the tools that we have on the board. I'm going to explain to you what they're used for. Then I'm going to separate all the essential tools from the non-essential tools. And once I've done that, I'd like to leave you with a thought. Ready? Let's begin. So as for the general overview, we have obviously the biggest tool of all, which is going to be our board. On top of our board, we're going to have some measuring tools, some sewing tools, cutting tools. Obviously, we're going to mark things, so we need some marking tools. Then we have some precision instruments for the finer details cleaning tools over here, pliers, and of course, our pressing tools. Let's begin with the most important tool of all, which is going to be our board. Now, your board should be made of wood, it should be set at the right height, and it should be covered properly. So, why does our board need to be made of wood? Well, first of all, we're going to use a lot of moisture and a lot of heat. That's going to create a lot of condensation and steam. If your board isn't made of wood, that steam will not be absorbed and it's going to be trapped between your fabric, your board cloth, and the board itself, thereby making your board cloth wet. You do not want to have a wet board cloth. So, you have two options. Option number one is a hardwood, which is usually very expensive and very heavy. Option number two, which I personally prefer, is going to be a plain door. Doors are very light and they are very cheap. And you can even find them outside if someone is building their house and they're throwing it away. Now, what you have to understand about doors is that you can't jump on them and sit on them and do your work on the board because they will break. They are usually hollow on the inside. Once you've got your board, you need to set it at the right height. Your board should not be any higher than your belly button, nor should it be any lower. It should be around just a little bit lower than your belly button, around your bladder. Any lower than that is going to cause you to bend forwards. That's going to put a lot of strain on your back muscles. That's going to travel through your neck and it's going to give you a very bad headache by lunchtime. If it's too high, you're going to have trouble pressing things that are, have to be placed on a sleeve board. So your arm is going to be right here. So just around your belly button is the ideal area. Play around and see what the right height is for you. Once you've got the right height, then you have to cover it. You can't just put like a piece of cloth on your board and say, hey, I've, I've got some board cloth. First of all, you need to have a cushion on top. That cushion has as a purpose to level out the material that is going to be pressed. Imagine you have a piece of fabric and the end is folded twice. One end of that fabric is going to be thicker. So if you don't have a cushion, that thick end of the fabric can't sink in so that your iron makes everything level. If it's very hard and it can't sink in, your iron is going to hit against it and you're not going to iron the surface evenly. The best thing to use for that cushion is going to be felt. If you can find 100% wool, good for you. If not, synthetic industrial felt is going to be equally fine. The most important thing to understand is that the surface of that felt shouldn't be very rough, obviously. Now, once you've got your felt, then you need to cover it with a cloth. Moleskin is the best cloth you can find, at least the best cloth I could find. It's densely woven, it's stiff, and it has a plain surface texture. Now, why should it be stiff? First of all, it should be stiff so that when your needle, if your needle goes into it, it can't lift up the fabric easily. If it's stretchy and loosely woven, your needle is going to catch the yarns every time you put the needle into the cloth and it's going to lift it up and before you know it, you're basting your work to your board. Now, the reason why it needs to have an even and plain surface texture is that if you are pressing with a heavy iron, 
you're not going to leave imprints of that fabric. A lot of times if you're using a tweed, you may get like a herringbone pattern on your lining or like some Shetland weave or whatsoever. So those are the things you need to know about your board. Now let's have a look at our measuring tools. Now, one thing I have to tell you about measuring tools is that there is a lot of rulers out on the market. You will have long rulers, short rulers, bent ones, straight ones. The most important thing to know is that if you are planning to buy a long, a large ruler that is supposed to mark straight lines, make sure that that is made from a material like metal or plexiglass because wooden rulers, especially the cheap and thin ones, will warp or bend. And if you hold them up, you'll see a nice curve. If you want that curve, go ahead. But if you want a straight line, invest in a ruler that is made from metal or plexiglass. Having said that, let's begin with the first ruler on our board. Now, the first ruler is going to be our L square, also known as the Taylor square. The reason why it's called the Taylor square is that most pattern cutting systems that are used today are based on proportional measurements. So if you want to know a given point, you will have to divide, let's say, the chest by three or the scale by four. Now, instead of going to the calculator and calculating it on that, this ruler already has those calculations printed on it. So it saves you a lot of time. If, however, you're using a system that doesn't work with proportional measurements, this part of the ruler may be irrelevant. Great tool to have for making and drafting patterns. Then we have this smaller ruler. Now, this is about 12 inches long, 30 centimeters. It has metric and imperial units on it. And it's really one of those uh, rulers that you're going to use during the making and uh, the drafting. Sometimes I put this on a fabric and if I want to make a consistent crease, for example, because it's made from metal and it's very thin, I can just fold the fabric over, put my iron on top and make sure that I have a nice consistent crease. Then we have our pattern master. Now the pattern master is a combination ruler. So you have a curved side and you have a straight side. If you're going to a cutting course or a fashion course and you don't want to bring all these rulers with you, this is a great ruler to have. Now, uh, what I like about the Pattern Master is that, first of all, it's transparent, so you can see through it, but it also has marked these distances of five millimeters on the metric unit version, and uh, it has distances of a quarter on the imperial one. Another good thing about it is that it has angles of 45 degrees and a center point, which means that you can mark the same distance on either side without having to shuffle the ruler around. Then we have my favorite protractor ruler. The reason why I like this so much is that if I have to measure or mark a line at a specific angle, this ruler makes it very easy for me to do because it has all the angles written on it. Now, obviously we as tailors can't do without our tape measure. A good tape measure ideally is made from fiberglass. It has both the metric and the imperial units printed on either side of it, and it's not very wide. Today's tape measures are about two centimeters wide, but you don't really need a wide tape measure. Obviously, we need the tape measure to measure our client, but also to cross-reference measurements from the pattern onto the finished garment. So that's that on the tape measure. Last but not least, I have this longer ruler, which I mainly use for drafting patterns, but if I'm working on an overcoat or a pair of trousers and I have to mark a long line, then this is the one that I will be using. So that's that regarding the rulers. Now I don't have curved rulers. I tend to use templates for that. These are the rulers that I'm using. So having covered that, the next thing I'm going to cover with you is going to be the sewing tools. You won't be able to make a jacket without a thimble. Now we use an open end thimble because we don't use the top of the thimble. We use the front of the thimble. A good thimble should have a metal lining on the inside so that when you put your finger in it, it feels comfortable and has a good grip. It shouldn't be too big so that your finger sticks out like this. Neither should it be too small so that it rests on top of your finger. Obviously, along with our thimble, we're going to be using some needles, small needles for delicate handwork, larger needles for going through shoulder pads, canvases and things like that. Let me tell you something. You don't need a pair of shears this big to feel like a professional tailor. This will do. This is about four inches, eight centimeters perhaps. And I will be using this on all types of fabrics, shoulder pads and trimmings. It's a very powerful pair of shears. It's made in Japan and it's not this big and it doesn't take a lot of space. 
I do, however, have separate shears for paper because obviously when I'm pattern cutting, I don't want to be using my fabric shears because it will blunt in the edges. And it's generally not a good idea to sharpen your shears often if it's not necessary. So I try to keep away from that. Then we have a peculiar looking uh, pair of shears here, which is actually for rug making to level out the knots on the rug. But I use this for cutting down my shoulder pad once the sleeve is secured around the armhole on a finished jacket. It has a very good grip and it's extremely sharp. Then there is a gardening scissor here for the mitres of a pocket, a smaller scissor for just cutting thread if I'm sitting somewhere and I'm padding. If I have a pocket on my shirt, I will have this in my pocket or I will bring it to the sewing machine and have it there. And last but not least, I have a longer scissor which has a bent end and round tips. Now this is fantastic for mark stitching because the round tip reduces the risk for cutting into the fabric and the curve allows me to have access to the thread without having to open those layers too far apart. So having said that, let's look at our marking tools. Obviously the most important marking tool is going to be our chalk. We need this to mark our lines on the fabric and chalks come in different colors. Uh, you have red, blue, yellow, black, white, but I wouldn't recommend using colored chalks on fabric. A lot of them leave stains and you won't be able to brush them out. There is also a waxed version available for uh, difficult heavyweight fabrics like tweeds because this will be brushed out within a second and so therefore you need something with a little bit of wax to stick to the fibers. Um, I'm using Jinbutsu chalk from Japan. It has a very fine composition and allows me to mark nice accurate thin lines which obviously improves the quality of my work. You can also use a chalk to mark your patterns if you're drafting and making a pattern on paper. But if you don't want to use chalk and you prefer something like graphite, there are graphite parts available that have the same feel as chalk and uh, you can just freehand the line and uh, as they say, develop your rock of eye. Obviously these have to be kept sharp and so you can use a chalk sharpener for that. However, be careful, a chalk sharpener will take away a lot of chalk. So you might find out that within a day you've gone through two pair of chalks and uh, you haven't really actually used them that often. Having said that, we have a pencil obviously for making patterns, a pen, not just for patterns but also marking canvases because chalk lines don't really become accurate and thin on color canvases for example and so having a pencil or a pen to mark a nice thin line is more ideal. And uh, then we have a pencil chalk which is really used to go through the buttonhole and mark where the button has to be uh, sewn. Obviously everything that we are going to do with graphite can be erased with a rubber. But then we also have two other marking tools which are these prickle wheels and there are two versions. One of them is very sharp. This one is meant to make holes. So if you have two layers of paper and you have a line on the top layer, you can just go over that line and that will make holes through both of the layers. And then you can remove your paper and you have a line which is marked with small holes. If, however, you don't want to mark holes on your paper, you can use the other version which is not sharp at all, uh, but this is really meant to use for paper chalk or carbonized paper. And so the way that would work is you would have two layers of paper, you would put the carbonized paper between them, and then you would just go over your line and these small uh, dots will put impressions on that, go through the ink, and that's how you've copied your line onto the other layer. Now having gone through our marking tools, Let's have a look at our cleaning tools. Now the first cleaning tool that I'm going to show you is going to be our brush. Now a wooden brush is extremely handy, especially if the handle is flat. Why? Because you can use that wooden part to absorb moisture from the fabric that you've pressed, but you can also lay it down and use it as a block. Obviously you can use it to brush things away, which is something I absolutely hate because all the dust is going to go into the air, in your drink, on your shelves, into someone else's lunchbox if you're in a workshop. And so for brushing dust away, instead of using the actual brush, I tend to use a lint roller. Now, obviously a lint roller will cost money because you have to buy the refills, 
But if you hate dust or you're in an environment where you want to keep things clean and you want to kind of like uh, blow the dust into someone else's face, then you can just go with this over your board or even on a finished jacket that has been on a mannequin for a while. Having said that, the next cleaning tool we have is this pump. Now, the only reason I use this pump is to sharpen my chalk lines. Now, let me tell you how I do that. Originally, this is used by photographers to blow away the dust on their lenses. But when I'm working on a pocket, let's say, and I want to make a very nice and clear, accurate line, there is always going to be some surface uh, chalk on the fabric. And so by blowing against that, you can see that instantly, not only am I thinning out the chalk line, but I'm also making it less visible. So that's really a great tool to have if you want to work precisely. The last cleaning tool that I have is going to be the scour, which is something I use to take away all the residue that gets stuck on the plate of my iron because, you know, a lot of these materials that we're going to use have starch on them. And if you don't soak them and kind of like wash away the starch, using a hot iron sometimes may burn the starch on your iron. Now, let's talk about our precision instruments. The first tool that we're going to have is the scraper. This is used by dentists and they scrape things away from your teeth. But I use this to fade away the edges of the plies of the wadding that I use for shoulder pads. Now, you can also use your fingers, just pluck away the edges. But if you want to really refine it and kind of like just take away the top layer, this is going to be the tool for that. Next, I have a scalpel, extremely sharp, extremely dangerous. Uh, use at your own risk. I use this to cut the miters of my jetted pockets because I have found that sometimes the tip of my shears or scissors, regardless of how sharp, just don't cut all the layers in that corner to the same degree, which sometimes makes the corner of the pocket look a little bit overworked. Then I have a Stanley knife, which I use for marking patterns on cardboard if I want to kind of like use that template more often. I wouldn't recommend using paper shears for that, obviously. And then after that, we have a few tweezers. Now you have long tweezers, short tweezers. Some of them, like this one, has uh, some sort of a teeth mechanism uh, which goes into the fabric and no matter how hard you pull, it won't let go. So that's sometimes great to have at your advantage. Then we have an owl, which I don't really use that often, but sometimes you must poke a hole in the fabric and open the yarns away from each other without actually cutting them. And so this is where this tool comes in handy. And last but not least, our best friend, the unpicker. Me and you are going to make a lot of mistakes. And when we are making those mistakes, we need to have a good tool to undo those mistakes. And so unpicking becomes part of the process. What I would suggest is you find an unpicker that has a large handle so that you can really hold it well and actually have a good grip. If you find those with a small handle, they're difficult to hold and you risk kind of like shooting out and then ripping your fabric. And so um, see if you can find uh, uh, one with a good handle or if you have one, protect it with your life. Let's have a look at our next tool, which is going to be our pins. These are not just for dressmakers. These are an extension of your hands and fingers. Pins allow you to pin layers together so that you can attend to another part of the work. You can take things that have been pinned together to the sewing machine, keep them organized, but also when you're fitting someone, you can quickly simulate a change by just pinning it into place. So don't feel as if you have to baste everything. Pins will do a lot of work for you and you won't be less of a tailor by using them. Obviously we need seller tape for if we are working on our pattern and we have to kind of like extend the part of the pattern. That's where we use it for. And then we have fray check, which is something that is used if you're, for example, making buttonholes. It will strengthen the cut edge of your buttonholes, but also prevent them from fraying. Another part that I like to use fray check is once the collar shape has been cut out or the lapel shape along with the front edge, those tend to fray a lot. And if you want to have nice, sharp, crisp edges, you can apply a thin line of fray check on them, which will keep them away from fraying at all times until you attend to them and turn them into something beautiful. 
Now let's look at our pliers. Here we have a notcher. This will cut a small V shape into the corner or the edge of your paper pattern, which will allow you to mark through that empty area without having to elevate your pattern. Then I have some other pliers here, which uh, some of them are sharp and very narrow at the tip, which I usually use for turning out peak lapels. Pliers are also very handy if your needle gets stuck between thick and heavy materials and so your hands can become sweaty and pulling them out becomes very difficult. And so plier will hold that and you can easily pull it out. Um, I have an interesting plier here that I sometimes use which has a lock and so if I close it, it will stay closed. It has a very sharp and strong grip and sometimes I have to pull a thread out uh, which I can't put back into the fabric. And for those moments, I will lock this around the thread and gently wiggle it until the thread comes out. The last plier-like tool that I have here on my board is going to be a hole punch, which of course we will need to punch the holes for our buttonholes. Having said that, let's have a look at our pressing tools here. When it comes down to the iron, you have a few options. You can either go for a dry iron or you can go for a steam iron. Both of them are available in heavyweight versions. Now, if you don't want to have a heavy iron or you don't want to have a massive boiler next to you, you can just use the domestic iron. Those have steam functions, they also have a water pump, and so you can easily spray some water if necessary because sometimes steam is not enough. I do have to say that if you do choose a dry iron, which is an iron without any holes, it's just a plain plate, you do need something that moistens up your materials. So you either have to use a spray bottle, which is really scarce to find a good one, or you can use a dauber. You can make these at home. It's just a rolled up piece of fabric. You have to dip this in a bowl of water and apply the water right on the area that you want to have uh, steamed. Something interesting about spray bottles is that if you can't find a good one, just use a used one from a window cleaner because those companies work with chemicals. And if their pumps leak on your carpet, they would run the risk of you suing them and they have to pay you a lot of cash. So they have invested actually a lot of money into having a good pump. Having said that, one of the most important things for pressing is to have a pressing cloth. This will protect your fabric from shining but it also will protect your fabric from burning, quite frankly, if you have a too hot iron. Um, this one particularly is made from moleskin, just like my board cloth. It's slightly thinner than my board cloth, but it spreads the steam really nicely through the fibers of the fabric that I'm working with. And uh, it feels nice. It has a nice surface. It doesn't feel like uh, rigid. You know, a thin linen or cotton may leave imprints. This, however, does not do that. When we are pressing things, it's nice to be able to dry them off and cool them down very quickly because that will set what you have pressed. And for that, we have a clapper. Now, a clapper can be just a big piece of wood, just a wooden block. And all you have to do is to really press this onto the steaming piece of fabric and the coolness of this and it being wood will absorb the moisture and dry it out. There is a misconception that a cold iron will do the same. A cold iron will not absorb moisture. This is also the reason why we don't work on, let's say, an iron board. If you put this on a steaming piece of fabric, it will instantly become wet. And in the worst case scenario, it will leave rusty bits and parts on your fabric. So this is really used as a weight for holding the patterns down on the fabric or holding some part of the garment while you're working on another part. Having said that, these are the tools that I'm using in my professional work and have been using during my apprenticeship. But the real question now is, are they really all necessary? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna separate all the essential ones from non-essential ones. And so if you're new to this and you want to buy all the pieces of equipment, you know exactly which ones to buy and so you don't therefore need to waste your money on fancy gadgets. Let's begin with our measuring tools. Now, if you have an L-square, which is going to be very essential if you want to follow systems with proportional measurements, then you don't really need to have the smaller ruler 
or the pattern master or the protractor or the very long ruler. Why? Because you can make long lines by extending this. You can make curved lines by using your free hand or make templates. And since the smaller rulers or the larger ones provide convenience in the most dead or alive scenario, the one ruler that you need is going to be your L square. So therefore, I'm going to be removing these rulers from the board. We can't, however, do without our tape measure because we still have to measure our clients and go around their body. And obviously, we can't do without our thimble and our needles. So let's have a look at our cutting tools. Since all of the other tools are just there to cut thread or do mark stitching or cut shoulder pads, all of those functions can be taken over by my main fabric shears. So therefore, I will remove all of these but only leave my fabric shears and my paper shears because I don't like to cut paper with my fabric shears. So I will remove these and put them aside. Next up is going to be our marking tools. Now, we don't need graphite because we can use chalk. Because we're not going to use graphite, we're not going to use a pencil, pen, chalk pencil. All these um, markers and these prickle wheels and neither do we need a rubber. So. These can go all away. We will be able to draft patterns and make jackets or other garments with just one single chalk. And if we are going to use our chalk for the sharpening, we don't really need a chalk sharpener because we can simply use any type of knife that doesn't have toothed profile. So therefore, I'm going to remove this. Then we have our cleaning tools. Now, Although I'm not a big fan of the brush for the brushing purposes, the brush is very handy if you want to use it as a clapper whenever it has a flat surface and handle, or if you want to use it as just a block to put the work on and work on it three-dimensionally. So I would say that the brush is essential. However, the lint roller is a luxury, so is the pump and the scour because you can clean the plate of your iron with beeswax or some other liquid that is meant to uh, clean the iron and keep it free of starch. Then we have our precision instruments. Now, obviously, I can fade the edges of any type of wadding with my fingers. I can just use my scissors or shears to make pockets. I will keep the Stanley knife because you will have to make cardboard patterns from time to time and not having that will then require you to have curved rulers. So I would say that this is more essential and will save you some money. Tweezers are all going to be irrelevant because what tweezers do really is to help us to finalize uh, our work with some finesse. But if we don't have them, we can still use our fingers and hands. So therefore, they will go along with the awl. Now, after that, we have our pins, seller tape and fray check. Fray check is a luxury. Pins can be replaced by basting since we have our needle and we're going to have some thread. But seller tape, I would say, is a little bit more important because we have to extend our patterns when we are cutting the pattern. And therefore, we need some sort of a glue to uh, use that extra paper. If you don't have seller tape, you may be able to use a substitute like a glue stick. But all the other ones will go away. Now, obviously, unpicker is going to be extremely important, so we're not going to compromise on that. And then after that, we have our pliers. Now, we can make small notches with just our paper shears, and we can pull out needles with sometimes a grip or a piece of rubber. Or you can just wrap a piece of cloth around your finger and just pull them out. But they're not going to be really essential. Neither is going to be the hole punch, because we can still cut fabric for uh, the holes of the buttonholes, but... Um, this again is a luxury. So then we have our pressing tools. Now we can't do any work without an iron, so we need an iron. But depending on what type of iron you have, if you have a steam iron, the spray bottle and the dauber becomes non-essential and I will remove that. But because I have a dry iron, for me it's important to have something that allows me to apply water. Because I can apply thin lines of water with the tip of my spray bottle by getting very close, Therefore, I will remove the daubers. Now, pressing cloth is non-negotiable. We need this to protect our fabric. 
but the clapper will become irrelevant if the back of our brush is flat and made of wood and doesn't have a lacquer on it. Since mine doesn't have a lacquer on it, but is curved, I can't use it as a clapper, but I can use it as a block. So I will leave the clapper there uh, for me to use. Other than that, we have the weights and weights can be replaced by everything in your household. So I will remove that as well. Now let's bring everything together. So we have our block, we have our spray bottle, we have our pressing cloth, we have our iron, our L square and our brush. Now what you're seeing here in front of me is a perfect example of Pareto's law. If you're not familiar with it, it's also known as the 2080 rule. And in our case, it says that 20% of the tools are going to be doing 80% of the work, if not all 100. But what I do want to emphasize here is that this is the bare minimum. And so if you're new to this and you don't have any of these tools, these are the essential tools that will allow you to make a jacket. But as you progress, you will acquire new tools and try to fine tune your arsenal because some parts require a little bit more delicacy than others. So what I would say is start with this if you don't have any tools and expand from there. As you can see, you can go a long way with the minimum amount of tools. The most important thing is to know which ones are the essential ones and look after them well. Make sure they're sharp, clean, and if you have to replace them, allocate a larger budget for them. Having said that, I'd like to leave you with a thought. You see, we as humans are tool makers. It's what we do best. It's what separated us from all the other animals. Tools not only allow us to understand the world better, but they also allow us to be faster and a lot more powerful and a lot more efficient. In his book, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, David Lance talks about the invention of invention. And according to Lance, there are five inventions that had a significant amount of impact on not only us as humans, but on the entire planet. Those five inventions are the water wheel, magnifying lenses, the mechanical clock, printing press, and gunpowder. The water wheel allowed us to use running rivers as a source of energy. But the invention of accessories such as cranks and gears allowed us to transfer that energy into a distant place and turn it into a mechanical motion. So cloth was being pounded, metal was being hammered, hops were being mashed, and rags were being pulped for paper. Imagine what kind of an efficiency that brings to all those industries. Then we had the magnifying lenses. Now, the first thing that the magnifying lenses did for us humans was to solve a biological problem. You see, around the age of 40, the crystalline lens in our eyes begins to harden, and that causes us to become farsighted. The development of magnifying lenses became what we know today as reading glasses. But that's not the cool part, you see. The cool part is that magnifying lenses allowed us to develop precision instruments, which is going to lead us to the next invention, and that's going to be clockworks. Now, clockworks became the mechanical clock. And in case you didn't know, timekeeping wasn't something that the average person would keep themselves busy with. Today, we are thinking about time all the time. But back then, people had the church bells or some other sign of the indication of the afternoon or the morning or noon itself. Now, what the clockwork did, or the mechanical clock, once it was developed, is first of all, it opened up a whole market for gadgets. Then it delegated timekeeping, which was usually done by the church or some other governing entity, to the average person. Not only were average people able to organize their days a lot more accurately, but time became the number one tool to measure productivity. Imagine that. Next, there is the printing press. Now, the printing press did a few things. First of all, it allowed us to fixate our knowledge onto paper and to spread it on a mass scale. You could somewhat say that the printing press allowed us to scale our ideas, but it also influenced the paper industry and paper production, because without paper, there wouldn't be no mass scale spreading of ideas and publishing of books. Now, without the printing press, I wouldn't be recommending this book to you, and neither would I have been reading it myself. And last but not least, we have gunpowder. Now, why was this such an important invention? 
You see, the Chinese had been using gunpowder way before anywhere else in the world knew even what gunpowder was. They were using it in their military, in fireworks. But gunpowder became really important once the Europeans started to use it. You see, they would corn the powder, which means that they would compress it into small kernels and pebbles. Not only would that ignite faster, but the release of energy was way more powerful than if you would use it in powder form. So, along with the development of metal industries, gunpowder gave the Europeans one of the most superior arsenal the history of mankind had ever seen. And in a world where seas were being explored and lands were being expanded, well, gunpowder surely became an important invention. So what's the takeaway here? Well, it's very simple if you ask me. If you're working on something and you feel that you can improve the work by either designing a new tool for it or invent a new procedure, do it, man. Don't hold back. You never know what your design is going to lead to. You never know what you're depriving the world of. So, if you've ever invented something or you're designing something new, share it with us on the community page of our website. You can find the link in the description of the video. How nice would it be that if you're learning something from me by watching these videos, I can learn something from you. My name is Reza. This was today's lesson. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to see you in the next one. Take care. It's not really a set, it's just one plier. Uh, I dropped it because it's hot and I like to drop it like it's hot. <laughs> Weights are really good if you're working on, for example, a pair of shrouds tra and it's really schön, sir. And so <laughs> in the Chinese version of this video, this is going to be translated back into English and then you will know what I've said. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.